All right, welcome everyone. Um, welcome to our second session of this series on the history of Black, Indigenous, and people of color social movements here in the US as well as Colorado. Um, tonight, we are going to be focused on San Luis, San Luis land rights. Um, and um, before we get into all of our content this evening, just wanna take some time to introduce myself. My name is Celeste Martinez. I'm the founder and owner of Celestial Alegria, um, and I work with individuals and organizations to ignite joy through transformation. Before becoming a life coach, facilitator, and consultant through Celestial Alegria, I was a community organizer for 10 years. And my organizing career started as a student, actually here at Regis University, and then continued to expand in various roles with nonprofit organizations based in the Denver metro area. And throughout my nonprofit experience, I was exposed to various organizing methodologies, processes on how to organize that were proven to be effective in local communities here in our state, as well as across the country. And in my personal, professional, and educational opportunities, this informed how I actually approached this particular project and putting together this series. So you might be asking yourself, what is this research project about or what is this series connected to? And really, it is learning from our past and how that can help shape our reality now as well as our future. As we learn about history, this is an antidote to individualism because this recognizes that our efforts for justice are intergenerational. Of those who came before, those who are living now, and the generations to come. And in the fall of 2020, the Colorado Trust reached out to me to create a report in support of their current grant program known as Building and Bridging Power. And one of the guiding questions that I was invited to research and respond to for that report was what kinds of organizing models are most common in the Colorado landscape? And in answering this particular question, the intent was for the Colorado Trust staff leading the Building and Bridging Power program to be more informed in their work and how they could support grantees to access resources as well as respond to the themes coming up of need. Um, what came up though that's important to note is that several of the grantees we're in the process of developing and or refining their organizing programs. And this approach that I used to answer this question of was what schools of thought are behind the majority of community organizing models in Colorado and why? And this resulted in explaining the origins of Saul Linsky's community organizing methodology because several of the most common models are either directly informed by this original methodology or are derived from this ideology. And this is not only common here in our state of Colorado, but also nationally across the nonprofit sector. And additionally, this trend reflected in the history of how Salinsky's methodology established credibility was then institutionalized into how community organizing became a profession in the nonprofit sector. What's important to understand though about this particular finding is that one of the ways Alinsky furthered credibility of his methodology was distinguishing his form of community organizing from that of black, indigenous, and people of color led social movements. And this was intentional to create a wedge between the two making these forms of power building efforts to appear completely different. And as a result, this created a racial inequity where we do not learn as much about efforts led by black indigenous people of color, especially when it comes to social movements. And many times this type of social movement organizing is not recognized as even a form of power building or community organizing in the nonprofit sector. And when we are dismiss that history, we miss out on a lot. Um, and so as a result um, in not learning that, this holds us back from looking to these stories as sources of inspiration to understand 
what we can potentially do in this current time. And so the purpose of this series overall is that um, this is to provide historical and sociological research um, to ensure that present and future generations of community organizers and leaders can draw inspiration from our history and center the stories of social movements led by Black, Indigenous, and people of color, and how movements often collaborated and were in solidarity with one another in the fight for racial justice. And so therefore, with the financial support of the Colorado Trust, I had the opportunity to develop two additional papers to that of the original one from 2020. And those are, first, the impacts of Solinsky's methodology on community organizing and BIPOC-led efforts, and the second being BIPOC-led social movements in the US and Colorado. And this includes summaries and a concurrent timeline of BIPOC-led movements, both nationally as well as here within our states. The topics that are covered in that particular paper include civil rights, the Black Panther Party, American Indian Movement, Chicano Movement, and the San Luis land rights struggle, which we're here to learn more about tonight. Um, our first session covered civil rights and the Black Panther Party. That was recorded and will be made available in English and Spanish. You can find information on that series as well as the upcoming series on my website page at www.celestialegria.com slash pop dash ed. Um, and, um, or if you signed up to participate in this, I think that will be sent out at some time. So um, this is why we're here today, right? To learn from these stories of collaboration and overlap between BIPOC-led social movements here in Colorado. And this fall education series focuses then on each of these social movements, who are those core leaders and the significant and events and actions that we can learn from. Once I kind of go over a short lecture um, talking about several of those things, then we will have a series of panelists um, who were either directly involved in these social movements, are family members of those core leaders, or are present day historians and archivists. And this brings me to introduce who our panelists are for this evening. Um, we have with us this evening Shirley Romero, who is one of the core organizers of the Land Rights Council, which is a grassroots organization which filed a lawsuit um, in support of their communal land rights and ultimately won the 150 year long battle to recognize their land rights. And we have with us as well, Dr. Nikki Gonzalez, who serves as the vice president of Regis's Office of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Excellence and who wrote her PhD dissertation in history on San Luis land rights struggle, which is titled Yo Soy Loco Por Esta Sierra. And this served as the primary research source um, for this summary included in the paper that I put together as well as for this presentation. We also have with us this evening, Marsha Goldstein, who is a historian, a community leader, and the wife of the late Jeffrey Goldstein, who served as the primary lawyer for the Land Rights Council as they fought um, for their communal land rights. We're gonna learn a lot more about each of our panelists, but just wanted to acknowledge them and thank them again for being here with us this evening. So let's get into um, the lecture portion of this evening. What's so beautiful and profound about San Luis land rights is that first we're talking about a relationship that people have with land. So it's important for us to understand then who are, the, who are the people of that land and the relationship that has emerged over time. So the San Luis Valley in Colorado is home of the original lands of the Pueblo, Ute, Comanche, and Arapaho people. However, the San Luis land rights struggle, which spans over 140 years, was inspired by Mexican settlers who were recruited to work the lands as part of the Sangre de Cristo land grant from 1848. And the central focus of this movement is rooted in the traditional communal farming and ranch practices established 
by the original Mexican settlers and carried on by the generations to follow. The organizing pursued by the San Luis Valley community birthed a series of local grassroots organizations that emerged at different points in their history. And in the latter part of their struggle, the San Luis community used coalition building as a strategic way to gain further support and awareness about their cause. While the San Luis lands rights struggle was influenced by the broader Chicano movement, this struggle was primarily shaped by core leaders and coalition building efforts that residents organized throughout 1970 and onward. The history of San Luis land rights struggle is very local and be commended as one of the greatest examples of rural organizing in Colorado and the United States in history. So where is the San Luis Valley? This is located in Southern Colorado, which includes San Luis, San Acacio, San Pablo, San Pedro, Chama, and San Francisco. And this is a map of Costilla County showing where each of these towns and communities are with red circles and blue dots. And the original Sangre de Cristo land grant was included, included this area and extended farther south, including Taos, New Mexico. And we'll reference uh, original image here in one moment. So let's talk about what were some of the conditions that actually inspired this particular social movement? Well, we have to reach back into history and kind of go through different pieces of that. But some of the key elements are conquest of the Americas, um, particularly the practices of Spain and Portugal and how that impacted um, indigenous peoples of this land, as well as throughout the Southwest region of what is now referred to as the United States. And a concept that was created through conquest and colonization that is land becoming private property, which is something that constantly um, was a challenge, um, especially when it comes to this land rights struggle. Additionally to that um, are land grants, what they are, how they came to be. The Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, um, which ended the Mexican-American War and essentially um, allowed the U.S. to acquire what is now known as Southwest region of the U.S. The Bubiane document, um, which is unique um, to this particular social movement and we will further define. And also the presence and infiltration, if you will, of companies and landowners upon what is communal lands. So with that, let's actually take some time to define each one of these. And let's start with conquest. So conquest is a practice of colonization to expand the wealth and power of Portugal and Spain also referred to as the Iberian Peninsula in alignment with the Catholic Church. When we talk about colonization, just to break that down, what that means is for a European country to force people off their land and then exploit where those people are displaced for people's labor, as well as the resources of that land to expand the wealth and power of a country with a particular set of interests. The reason why I present this definition, which is informed by Roxanne Dubar Ortiz in an indigenous people's history of the United States, is that this very much informs how land grants came to be and how we arrived at this um, specific um, movement, social movement in history. Because the impact of conquest left us and colonization with three core elements that are not just unique to San Luis Valley, but really across the United States and many other places in the world. It created these concepts of making land into private property for the first time. Before this, in the system, economic system of feudalism, land was not seen as private property, but rather there was a communal relationship to it. Um, and so what I mean by this um, is that Making land into private property required for people to be violently removed from their homeland, which included a destruction of culture and language, as, and then forcing people to live in other places and to work on other lands in order to survive. 
in the economic system that was colonization. Additionally, um, there was the creation of white supremacy. What we, what we understand from the time of colonization and conquest is that race was actually created. And it was created intentionally to neutralize class tensions because people were all of a sudden landless and facing destruction around their culture. So race became an identity that people could then access rights and privileges to. And by privileges, I mean a set of benefits, favors, and advantages in a society's culture. And lastly, um, there is terminal narratives. Um, and part of the way that Roxanne Dubar Ortiz describes this is that these are false narratives, false stories, alternative stories about what colonization and conquest actually were. Oftentimes, when we learn about Europeans coming to the Americas, we are told that Europeans brought disease with them, and this somehow mass wiped out indigenous populations. And while yes, this is a factor in what caused the death of indigenous people across the Americas, as well as the death of many African people who are enslaved by this economic system and transported on ships. To say that it was disease alone is in fact false. It's a lie. It's to cover up the reality that colonization and conquest were violent forms of um, displacement and um, extermination of peoples in order to create economic stability. And so to further expand on this, Roxanne de Buart Ortiz artic articulates in her research how nearly all the population of the Americas was reduced by 90% following the onset of colonization projects, decreasing the targeted indigenous populations of the Americas from 100 million to 10 million. And Overall, the reason why I emphasize this is that these types of narratives that try to say that disease or other things um, were more prominent as part of the process of colonization is to essentially um, cover up how central violence was and still is in the culture of conquest. Essentially, this is to bury how genocide, war, pill pillaging, and enslavement were forms of violence that were centrally used in the process of colonization and conquest of the Americas, as well as many other places throughout the world. And this was all with the interest for people to gain more land as private property to then accrue more power and wealth. So this brings us to land grants. What are land grants? A practice of the Spanish government to reward an individual or small set of individuals and or families with a territory of land for their effectiveness and conquest. This is how they first and originally were created. The first land grants were predominantly established in northern New Mexico. Um, the, the first one is uh, the Trisco land grant, which is closest to Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, and then many others were created over time to establish most common what is present day, again, northern New Mexico and southern Colorado. And Mexicans from high populated areas of Mexico were recruited to actually work the land of these land grants and were offered in exchange both individual and communal land rights for their labor um, and care of the land. And this is why the term Mexican settlers is, is used in the research um, summary that I've put together, as well as how we will refer to the earlier parts of the San Luis community um, because of that particular relationship. This is um, also important to note that after Mexico's independence from Spain in 1821, the Mexican government continued to recognize land grants. And then later the US somewhat but not fully recognized land grants when the Southwest was acquired from the signing of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. 
So this brings us to a few key historic events as it relates to the Sangre de Cristo land grant, which includes Costilla County of Colorado and the San Luis Valley. First is that in 1843, the, San Lu the Sangre de Cristo land grant was established by S Stephen Lewis and Nartrisco Bubien. In 1847, Carlos Bubien, who was the father of um, Narisco, became the owner of the Sangre de Cristo land grant due to the death of uh, Stephen Lewis and Narisco. This was actually something that happened um, during a um, revolt that the Pueblo led in Taos, New Mexico. Um, and that is also incorporated in the land grant. And in... Um, Throughout the 1850s and 1870s, Carlos Vivian actually recruited uh, Mexican settlers to come and work and live on the land, including the San, San Luis Valley. And so here is actually a map from 1882 of the Sangre de Cristo land grant and where it originally lies. You can see how it overlaps with Southern Colorado as well as Northern New Mexico. This also brings us then to discuss what is the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. On February 2nd of 1848, Mexican Congress ratified the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo with Mexico, accepting the Rio Grande as the Texas border and ceding almost half of its territory, which incorporated present day states of California, New Mexico, Nevada, and parts of Colorado Arizona, Utah, and even Oklahoma to the United States in return for $15 million. This is informed by research of Rodolfo Acuna from uh, History Occupied of America, uh, History of Chicanos. Essentially, what happened is that um, Mexican Congress prepared the, what is known as the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo to conclude the Mexican-American War from 1846 to 1848. And this then uh, allowed for the U.S. to accumulate what is now known as the Southwest region of the U.S. What's important, though, for us to take away from the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo and how it specifically inspired the social movement in the San Luis Valley is due to three aspects. In Article 8, 9, and 10, this actually referred to the rights of Mexicans in what is referred to as the occupied territory to be acquired by the U.S. And specifically in Article 9 of the treaty, this granted Mexicans the enjoyment of all rights of citizens of the United States according to principles of the Constitution and in the meantime shall be maintained and protected in the free enjoyment of their liberty and property and secured and the free exercise of their religion without restriction. This again is informed by um, the work of Rodolfo Acuna in Occupied America. So the three takeaways, right, from the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo is that this granted Mexicans, as well as Mexican settlers who lived on land grants, right to US citizenship, land rights, both individually and communally, as well as protected freedom of religion. And the protection of freedom of religion was in particularly important because many people um, predominantly practice Catholicism due to the influence of the Catholic Church and the, part of and the impact of conquest. And they were joining into the US, which was a predominantly Protestant state. A common saying you might hear from Mexican Americans, many of whom now may identify as Chicano throughout the Southwest, is that the border crossed us which is in fact true because of how the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo worked. The treaty did not note um, how to classify Mexicans in regards to race, and it's important because this experience is different than other black, indigenous, and people of color when, within the US, as well as social movements that are covered in this series. But Mexican settlers in San Luis and their descendants, however, did continue to face discrimination due to their class and ethnicity. And later in the 1960s, when the Chicano movement began to emerge in New Mexico, California, Texas, and Colorado, 
This then influenced the San Luis community to understand their identity in a new way as Chicanos. And this was largely due to the popular and political education efforts led by Shirley Romero, who we have here with us today, as well as Rey Otero, who was a core leader and part of the Land Rights Council. And you might be wondering, what do we mean by this term Chicano if it's not familiar to you? Well, as Armando B. Rendon describes in the prologos or the introduction of the Chicano Manifesto, the word Chicano was claimed as a shared identity to describe a different cultural and political reality faced by Mexican Americans in the United States and was an attempt to coalesce generally disparate efforts in the Southwest. So the term Chicano captures the racial and ethnic experience of Mexican Americans as people who are most commonly a racial mixture of indigenous and Spanish people while being cultured by whiteness because of living in the United States. Again, something that's important to understand is that this identity of being Chicano or Mexican and Latino are all terms of ethnicity, referencing people's culture, traditions, customs, and even language. But in that, um, there are people of all races who belong to each of these ethnic groups, including Chicanos. This brings us to the Bubain document. Um, this document uh, was created when um, Mexican settlers of the San Luis community urged Carlos Bubien to formalize their oral agreements about their land rights into a written document. And as a result, Carlos Bubien then created what is referred to as the Bubien document in 1863. And in Dr. Gonzalez's dissertation, Yo Soy Loco Por Esta Sierra, The History of Land Rights Activism in the San Luis, Colorado, from 1863 to 2002, she describes, um, she ha offers this quote. The settlers writes to La Sierra, referring to the mountain that we saw at the beginning of this presentation, included using the mountain for substance, substance grazing, for wood gathering, both for lumber and firewood, for recreation and for hunting and fishing. Bubain also added a clause which instructed people to take care of the land and can, to conserve its resources for future generations. What's important for us to note about this particular quote is that this document essentially um, encompassed what were the communal land rights that San Luis, the San Luis community had in relation to La Sierra, the mountain, um, and how that would continue to support their farming and ranching and access to water. However, even though that existed, there were many different companies as well as individual landowners after Carlos Bubian died in 1864 that tried to exploit the land for their own individual monetary gain and often did so by dismissing the communal land rights of the San Luis community which led to a long struggle for those communal land rights to be recognized. And brings us now then, who were the core leaders, organizations, and a significant timeline of events as it relates to this social movement. So once again, in 1864, Carlos Bubain died, and William Gilpin, who served as Colorado's first governor, purchased parcels of the Sangre de Cristo land grant for about $41,000 with a written agreement that the settlers, the Mexican settlers who already lived on that land and had individual and communal land rights, that they would have their rights respected. However, this was not necessarily the case of how Gilpin continued to proceed um, in the businesses that he created. And so in 1871, as a response of the community, El Comité de Merced, was formed by the San Luis community to resist attempts by Gilpin, as well as his business um, partner, William Blackmore, to exploit the land um, and dismiss San Luis residents and their land rights. Gilpin and Blackmore actually would use some predatory practices where they would try to convince San Luis residents to sign away their 
communal land rights in exchange for titles on multiple occasions. And the president of El Comité de Merced um, was known as Fernand, Fern, Fernand Meyer. Um, and he was actually one of the few residents that was bilingual in English and Spanish. And a part of the predatory practices that Gilpin and Blackmore would try to exercise um, by convincing San Luis residents to give up their land rights, he, they would have been sure that Meyer was actually out of the community. Um, so they would convince people to sign documents in English when predominantly folks' primary language was in Spanish. Um, and all of that to say, while this practice started to happen, um, the Comité de Merced was very strategic and actually amplified how these predatory actions of Gilpin and Blackmore were impacting their community and submitting their experiences to the Denver newspaper uh, at the time, as well as that story being circulated and picked up for other newspapers along the East Coast. In 1873, um, there was a court case that was filed by a company that was created by Gilpin and Blackmore, known as the United States Freehold Land and Immigration Company, um, versus a man named John G. Tamlin. And this was filed in Costilla County, again, the county image that we referred back to at the beginning, um, to affirm if Sangre de Cristo land grant was actually valid since the size exceeded five times what is outlined in the Mexican Colonization Act of 1824. And the case went actually all the way to the US Supreme Court, who ultimately ruled in favor of the company. Something interesting to note um, is that Tamlin was actually kind of a mythical figure. Some say that he was just a random person who perhaps lived on Fort Garland, but wasn't actually a resident of the local community. There's not a ton known about Tamlin now, but what's significant here, and the reason why I want to uplift that, is for those who are um, in, in um, organizing campaigns and trying to build power against corporations, it's important to understand what tactics might be used, including perhaps making up people to create a lawsuit to justify your pow their power. In the 1800s, um, or in the 1880s, the United States, um, sorry, in 1887, a legal statement was filed by San Luis residents describing that Gilpin knew that a third of the southern portion of the Sangre de Criso land grant was given to the original Mexican settlers and his company refused to acknowledge ownership. In 1880s, um, the United States Freehold Land and Immigration Company um, attempted to develop lands near San Pedro and San Pablo, impeding on water rights of those communities. And by 1887, the company further violated water rights of these communities and the Asikina Association associate, associate organized in defense of their water rights. Essentially, there was constant um, attempts to negate people from accessing um, basic things that they needed for their survival in relationship to the land. And by 1900, the United States Freehold Land and Immigration Company versus Gallegos, which is another lawsuit, um, was filed, claiming that San Pedro and San Pablo communities were overusing their water rights. And the Asakin Association filed a legal motion to dismiss their claim for a lack of evidence, where the Costilla County Court ruled in favor of the community. The, community filed an the company filed an appeal that was heard by the U.S. 10th Circuit Court in Denver, who ruled in favor of the company, reducing the community's water supply to less than half. However, years of drought followed this particular court ruling, and residents had priority for accessing water, which left the company with no water for development, ultimately causing them to go bankrupt, um, because their plans was to continue to develop and exploit the land and with no regard to the local community. By 1902, um, the same company sold 840 
81,437 acres to a group of developers under the name of Costilla Estates Development Company, known as CEDC, and was made up of prominent businessmen and politicians from Colorado Springs. In 1903 through 1926, the CEDC filed lawsuits against residents to intimidate them so they would sell their land and water rights. And the CEDC was successful in these efforts of these individual lawsuits where they actually gained an additional thousand acres um, from this particular tactic. However, this, was, this created a significant rift between San Luis residents who stayed and lived in the community and the CEDC. In 1910, the CEDC planned to develop a reservoir to acquire water rights, and the San Luis community formed a grassroots organization to resist these attempts. Ultimately, the Sanchez Reservoir was constructed by the San Luis Water and Power Company, and with less access to water, several San Luis resident families were displaced because of their farming and ranching branching practices no longer feasible and accessible to them. In 1916, the CEDC attempted to fence in La Sierra, the mountain tract that residents have communal land rights to, and restrict their access so that the CEDC could further their development plans. The San Luis, there were San Luis community leaders who included J.C. Lobato, Manuel Antonio Manzanares, Juan Maste Maestas, and other residents um, who actually went to the mountain track and tearing down the signs that were put up by the CEDC and confronting officials um, saying that these, were, these actions were in violation of their land rights. And when the CEDC would not concede, San Luis residents formed a grassroots organization who took action in two ways. First, by going to La Sierra um, as a group bearing arms um, as a means of self-defense of their lands and their rights. And second is that they held a meeting inviting the CEDC, CEDC ranch manager, E.P. Valentine, explaining how the company was in violation of their land rights. And by the end of this meeting, convinced him to actually contribute to their legal fund in order to sue the CEDC for their actions. And so here we can see how the San Luis community was very victor was victorious in their efforts. And the CEDC ultimately did take down their signs and stopped harassing the community momentarily. In 1948, a group of San Luis sheep herders formed an organization to also assert their communal land rights to La Sierra. And the CEDC's response was once again to put up signs and demand that residents pay fines if they wanted to access the land. The San Luis residents then contacted attorney Ralph Moses of, Alamo of Alamosa, Colorado, to support them in clarifying what their land rights are. And Moses later traveled to the San Luis community um, holding a meeting in Chama, where he clarified at that public meeting what people's communal land rights were to La Sierra and how they could best exercise them. By 1959, um, Jack P. Taylor, who was a lumberjack from North Carolina, negotiated with CEDC to purchase 77,500 acres of mountain track. And Taylor saw the local residents as a barrier to his interest in logging the land for profit. He built fences and the San Luis residents tore them down in protest. Taylor later um, rebuilt the fences and hired armed guards to keep San Luis residents out of accessing La Sierra. So residents also escalated um, by burning down bridges and corrals that Taylor had built. And the San Luis community formed a, a grassroots organization known as La Asociación de los Derechos Cívicos, or the Association of Civil Rights, to protect themselves against companies and private landowners like Taylor. And this is an image of what um, 
is the land track that um, Taylor acquired and how that relates to um, La Sierra. All of this to say is that um, the San Luis, land, San Luis community, when they formed La Asociación de Derechos Cívicos, they did so with a sort of infrastructure in this time where they established leadership positions like president, vice president, secretary, and treasurer. And they also asked that all members of their association pay dues that went towards legal fees and other operating expenses for their organization. The reason why I point this out is that it's important to have structure for our grassroots communities organizations. And this was something that was consistently strong in how San Luis community organized and established grassroots organizations throughout the long struggle that they fought. By 1961, on January 8th, Carlos Medina, who served as the president of La Asociación, called a meeting focused on a summons by Taylor and emphasized the importance of organizing as a group to defend their rights by any means necessary. And by November 23rd, um, Thanksgiving of that year, Taylor and two of his ranch hands encountered three residents of San Luis on La Sierra, and he considered them to be trespassing, so he attacked them. And the San Luis community violently rebelled against Taylor because he harmed three of their own. After this violent dispute, Taylor filed a lawsuit with the U.S. District Court and this case is known as Taylor versus Hakes, where he attempted to discredit residents' claim to shared land rights as it related to his property. And La Asociación and responded by hiring their own attorney, originally Ilu Romero from Taos, New Mexico, and then later Eugene Tepley, who is based in Denver, Colorado. Um, Romero's lack of experience um, did not set up La Asociación effectively to fight against this lawsuit. And later, when they fired him because of his lack of organization and responsiveness to their needs, Tepley uh, frantically tried to um, dig into all of the records to support their case as best as possible. But despite um, his best efforts in 1965, the U.S. court rejected the arguments of La Asociación and their communal land rights. And this loss eventually led to the dissolution of La Asociación, and many families were struggling to maintain their farms and ranches since they could no longer access La Sierra um, during this time, which caused a lot of relocation of folks across the Front Range of Colorado into cities such as Pueblo, Colorado Springs, and even Denver. Something else that's important to note that happened in 1965 is that the Catholic Church um, Second Vatican Council named social justice as a priority. The reason why this is significant is that the relationship of the San Luis community with the Catholic Church had a strong influence and presence. And um, when this shift happened within the Catholic Church, this then created a window of opportunity that later on, an elder known as Apollina Real saw to bring issues of um, related to land rights um, to churchgoers and in partnership with pastors. Additionally, um, this shift in the Catholic Church also created a set of money um, through the Catholic Campaign of Human Development, which would later fund and source the support of the Land Rights Council, as well as other efforts um, in Southern Colorado related to the Chicano movement. But let's fast forward a little bit to 1974 to 1975. And here we have Apolina Real, Shirley Romero, and later Rey Otero, who organized the San Luis community to assert the communal land rights through um, the local Catholic church known as Most Precious Blood, door knocking in their community, and holding youth meetings. There was also other variety of strategies that they used, including hosting barbecues where they would share what people's land rights were, um, as well as just conversations with people uh, about the impacts that they were experiencing from, the, from Taylor's decisions to close off La Sierra. And in 1978, on September 9th, 
the Land Rights Council it was founded. Um, later that year, Tierra y Libertad newspaper was first published and circulated in San Luis across and across the Chicano movement with the support of La Cucaracha newspaper, which was from Pueblo, Colorado. Um, additionally, the Land Rights Council supported the creation of Yavasta newspaper, and this was circulated across Colorado's Western Slope. And this again was to raise awareness about the issues that were happening in San Luis, as well as what people's land rights were and why they should access them. Lastly, around this time of establishing the coalition, um, Land Rights Council leaders started to reach out to the American Indian movement for their support and solidarity in their ongoing fight. And by 1979, the Land Rights Council collaborated with Producciones Estrella Roja to create a slideshow and then later a documentary known as La Tierra, Last Stand in Costilla County about the land rights struggle they were facing to spread greater awareness across the Southwest region of the United States, but as well as really globally later on. And in the spring, um, the Land Rights Council presented on a panel at a natural, national Mecha conference hosted at Metro State College. Then they traveled to universities throughout California to educate Chicanos about their land rights struggle. And the National Land Camp Out Conference was also held by the Land Rights Council, gathering Chicano leaders from across the movement, across the Southwest region of the United States to be hosted specifically in the San Luis community. So again, they could share more about what they were facing and why their efforts and solidarity was important. By July 19th of 1979, there was the Chama National Land Conference held by the Land Rights Council in partnership with the American Indian Movement where they express solidarity around treaty violations and other forms of discrimination. There were Native American leaders who invited Land Rights Council members to participate in a ritual known as Sweat Lodge, as well as other ceremonies, which further reinforced an alliance between these groups and allowed for many Chicanos to become reconnected with their Native roots. The Land Rights Council continues um, continued building coalition by forming alliances with other social movements and organizations, including the Black Panther Party, the Puerto Rico Nash Puerto Rican Nationalist Movement, Japanese American activists, Palestinians, and the Socialist and Communist Parties of America. By 1980, on January 22nd, Jeff Goldstein was hired by the Land Rights Council as well as his firm to serve as the lead legal representation um, for their organization. Because ultimately that was the strategy that the, that the organization decided to pursue after many other negotiations of other strategies that could have been pursued. And by June, um, the Land Rights Council became the, cen uh, became the center of an annual festival that is local to the community around Santa Ana and Santiago promoting the importance of the legal strategy that they were pursuing and presenting the slideshow that they created with Pro Producción Roja Estrella. And at this annual festival, San Luis residents who had been displaced would often return to um, the local community for these festivities. And this was so as a way then for more and more people to be aware of what was happening and the organizing efforts that were being pursued. By October, Riz Terejina, leader of La Alianza Federal de Mercedes, spoke to 150 San Luis residents about land rights struggle of Chicanos in northern New Mexico, um, which is also referred to regionally as an area called Tierra Amarilla. And the Land Rights Council also created a booklet this year called La Merced Sangre de Cristo, El Valle de San Luis, to educate people on land rights issues and the legal strategy that was being pursued. So as we can see, 1980 was a pretty busy year for the Land Rights Council, but they created many tools and strategies to really get the word out about what they were doing and, and how they were going to pursue the legal battle that would then continue for 22 years.
By March 11th in 1981, the Land Rights Council filed Real versus Taylor with the support of 100 San Luis residents with the following arguments. One, that Taylor failed to provide notice to residents on what he intended to do with his land that included La Sierra, the communal lands that the San Luis community had legal rights to. Two, that the 1863 Bubain document affirmed the individual and communal land rights of San Luis residents. And three, that the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo obligated the United States to honor land rights granted from Mexican law. And so this three arguments then guided the overall battle for the years to come. And by 1986, the courts declared their ruling without going to trial, affirming the previous ruling of Taylor versus Jaquez from 1965, once again in favor of Taylor and his private property. But the community, while this was a huge blow, did not give up. They proceeded to persist. And by 1989, Jack P. Taylor died and his son, Zachary Taylor, became the new owner of the 77,500 acre, acre mountain track. And Zachary Taylor inherited also a great amount of debt from the legal battles that, as well as unpaid taxes from Jack P. Taylor. And by March 5th of 1989, there was 151 federal agents, including the Division of Wildlife, who raided the San Luis community with search warrants arrest warrants and documentation that poaching had occurred and resulted in the arrest of 108 people. What I want to note about this event in particular, and something that we learned in our last session around civil rights and the Black Panthers, is that it was very common for the US government to track what efforts were being done by social movements. And the San Luis community was not immune to that level of surveillance. Part of what this raid reflects is also um, the ways that the US government in some ways obstructed um, what was going on um, and, and creating um, a sense of disarray um, for people moving forward. By 1991, um, the Land Rights Council filed for an appeal on Real versus Taylor. Again, not giving up on the legal strategy as the best way to pursue access to their the communal land rights and have them recognized. And by 1993, there was a series of significant events and actors who started to come into play. First, we have Ken Salazar, who was originally from the San Luis Valley and served as the executive director of the Colorado Department of Natural Resources who urged the governor, Governor Romer at the time, to take notice of the land rights struggle that was happening in San Luis Valley. And in that spring, Zachary Taylor announced that he had a desire to sell the ranch to pay off back taxes as well as the legal debts that he had inherited. By April 20th, the Colorado State Supreme Court reviewed the appeal presented by Jeff Goldstein with, the, with 50 San Luis residents and attendants and this reopened the Real versus Taylor court case. During the summer, Costilla County Conservancy District decided to work towards local ownership of La Sierra after working with local residents to fend off a Texas company who attempted to extract resources from the community. And this led to the creation of La Sierra Foundation. So what's significant about this particular event is that this started to introduce uh, for the first time a new strategy other than the legal strategy. That in fact, the community should consider purchasing um, La Sierra as a way to once again acquire their rights. However, this would remain as an ongoing um, point of tension and discussion throughout the rest of the land rights struggle. By September 28th, Governor Romer signed an executive order to create a Sangre de Cristo Land Grant Commission. Um, this again was from the efforts of Ken Salazar advocating for Governor Romer to take attention to the issue at hand. By December 29th, the commission released a plan advocating 
that the Con Conservation Fund, a uh, National Environmental Foundation, purchased the land from Taylor to serve as a state wildlife open area and be maintained as a state park. And La Sierra Foundation also affirmed this to be the best strategy. However, the Land Rights Council did not agree. And this created a great amount of distrust between their grassroots organization, the State Commission, and La Sierra Foundation. So by 1994, on February 5th, 40 employees of the state and federal agencies toured Taylor's Ranch and discussed the benefits of making La Sierra into a state park. Land Rights Council members were critical of this tour and many felt disrespected with how the tour was conducted. Additionally, the way that state employees and federal agencies came to the community was really activating around the traumatic experience they had from the raid of the wildlife division just uh, several years before. And by March 16th, Ken Salazar committed $12 million from the state and an agreement to offer tax breaks to Zachary Taylor. However, on this particular day, negotiations fell through with the commission because the Taylors, the family, did not want to settle for anything less than the asking price of the ranch tract at that time of $21 million. Later on, on March 19th and 26th, the Land Rights Council would hold meetings to discuss the current situation and what their options were. They invited indigenous leaders from Hawaii and the Lakota Sioux to share on how they fought for their own land rights and sovereignty. And the Land Rights Council fortified their commitment to the legal strategy and decided at this time it was important for themselves to distinguish who they were and what they were fighting for from La Sierra Foundation. And by doing so, they renounced their positions of participation in La Sierra Foundation. And Goldstein, um, Jeff Goldstein was actually away when these meetings took place, but upon his return to the San Luis community, he respected their decision and sent a letter to renounce his participation, both in the commission and the foundation, and that his role was as a defender of the people. By May 2nd, the Colorado State Supreme Court ruled three to four to send the legal case of Real versus Taylor back to the local court in Costilla County. By June 1st, the Land Rights Council um, board sent a four page letter to formally withdraw their connections and involvement from the commission and foundation and ask them not to interfere in any of their lit litigation efforts that were to come. By 1995, in the spring, Zachary Taylor announced that he had contracted Stone Forest Industries to produce, 20, to, to produce 2,000 three-bedroom homes in the next four years on the mountain track. And this greatly concerned San Luis residents about their continued access to water because so much of the relationship of the Asina system relied on snowmelt to then create access to water ongoing for farming and ranching. By the summer, Zachary Taylor published sized his plan to sell the land for 21.5 million with the agreement to a buyer that he could continue logging over the next decade. And this spurred environmentalists to become more involved with the Land Rights Council and to join in their coalition. Tensions continued to remain high between the Land Rights Council, the commission, and foundation during this period of time. By 1996 through 1998, the Land Rights Council with a coalition of supporters, including environmentalists, would host three-day convenings, particularly in the summer, to protest Zachary Taylor and the Stone Container Corporation to cease logging immediately. And numerous protests would continue each summer well through 1998. And this included civil disobedience to block loggers from their work. And loggers at times would respond violently to protesters. And the Land Rights Council was very strategic in how they magnified these injustices and attacks 
through media coverage. By 1997, in September, La Sierra Foundation dissolved due to the commission's failure, the state commission's failure, to successfully reach an agreement with the Taylor family to purchase the land. And the former foundation leaders then shifted their support to once again back the Land Rights Council and their legal strategy. By September 22nd, Zachary Taylor offered to settle a lo the lawsuit out of court with 2,500 acres if they agreed, they meaning the San Luis community, never to trespass on any part of the ranch or litigate again, or the Taylor family would take the land back from the San Luis residents that he was offering. The Land Rights Council called a meeting to discuss this offer, but they saw this as a distraction to their attorney for being prepared to defend their legal case and decided to reject the offer because this was the night before. On September 23rd, the district court hearing was um, conducted to review if Jack Taylor had in fact given sufficient notice to San Luis residents. And Judge Percone of the time ruled that both sides had legitimate claims and so he scheduled for a future trial. By May 2nd, this started an eight day trial known as Lobato versus Taylor. And this took place at Costilla County Courthouse, essentially retrying the 1981 Real versus Taylor case to address their land rights. By June 15th, Judge Percone ruled against the San Luis community affirming the ruling from 1965, Taylor v. Hawkes. And the Land Rights Council then pivoted to the Colorado Court of Appeals because again, they refused to give up. By 1999, Zachary Taylor did sell the Mountain Track Ranch to former Enron executive Lou Pai. And by June 24, 2002, the Colorado State Supreme Court ruled four to two, that San Luis community could once again access La Sierra and exercise their communal land rights, essentially creating a victory of this social movement. Now in this, I've covered quite a bit of the events, but let's just review briefly what were some of the actions and strategies that we can learn from this social movement. First, the importance of knowing your rights especially as it relates to land and water, both individual and communal. Second, the will that they had to fight for their rights by any means necessary, including exercising their rights to bear arms to defend their rights and their land. One of the key strategies that happened throughout grassroots organizations over time was legal. They understood the importance of documenting their rights with the Bubain document filing lawsuits, seeking lawyers who actually could support them, as well as partnering with lawyers who were more versed in social movement work, including that of Jeff Goldstein, who previously had experience in his firm in supporting many different social movements. They knew the importance of establishing grassroots organizations with a leadership body and roles, as well as having membership dues be a part of the model of their organizations. They sought out popular education, both through circulation of newspapers, community presentations, um, continuing to spread the word about these different issues at many different types of community gatherings, festivities, and so forth. They spread awareness about their cause, not just locally in Colorado, but beyond across the US, as well as internationally and part of the coalition building efforts that they had. The coalition efforts included members of the Chicano movement, American Indian movement, Japanese Americans, Puerto Ricans, Palestinians, and environmentalists. And in all of that, that truly supported the strength and the power of this coalition to have the momentum and to continue to fight and win. They hosted conferences where they would convene this coalition of supporters. And by organizing this, as well as creating opportunities for people to understand their relationship with the land, this also further fortified their, their power building efforts. 
And then lastly, they took direct action, both through civil disobedience as well as types of direct action where they would attend court hearings in mass and raise awareness about what was happening. So this now brings us to our panelists who also can speak to a wider breadth of what I've shared with you about this particular struggle. And so with that, I'd love to invite our panelists up. Um, first, um, starting with introductions of each person. So tonight, again, once again, we have Shirley Romero, who was born and raised in El Valle de San Luis in the town of San Luis, Colorado, which is the oldest settlement in the state. She is a 30-year educator in the Colorado public school system who has taught ethnic studies with a focus on retention and graduation of Chicanos and Mexicano students, as well as parental involvement. As a Chicana activist and community organizer, Shirley has been involved in many community struggles, most notably the 37 year long legal battle to regain historical use rights to the Sangre de Cristo land grant. And this class action lawsuit was known as Labato versus Taylor in the, and is one of the longest cases in US history. Currently, Shirley is a community organizer for the San Luis Food Sovereignty Initiative a project with the goal of growing fresh vegetables for families and an effort to curb diabetes and obesity in the San Luis community. As the executive director of Move Mountains Youth Project Inc., the organization partners and youth leaders assist in this effort by learning indigenous practices of growing food. And Shirley is also the mother of four daughters and two grandsons. With that, I'd like to invite up Shirley. Yeah. Also on our panel this evening, we have Dr. Nikki Gonzalez, who was born in Denver and has deep roots in the coal mining and agricultural communities of Northern and Southern Colorado and Northern New Mexico. Like many Mexican Americans in this region, her grandparents moved to Denver during World War II for economic opportunities. She's the mom of two boys who are historians of their own right, Danny and Teddy. Nikki is a graduate of Yale University with a Bachelor's of Arts in English Literature and from CU Boulder, a PhD in American History, where currently she serves now as the Professor of History and a Vice Provost for Diversity and Inclusion here at Regis University. She specializes in the history of American West, has written on the history of the Sangre Cristo land grant and the San Luis community in their long legal and cultural struggle to protect their historic land rights. Nikki's most recent projects include a historic context project, a collaborative project with the city of Denver, which will inform the city's historic preservation decisions and an oral history of Chicano Vietnam veterans. She has served as the first Latina state historian from 2021 to 2022, and currently chairs the Colorado Governor's Naming Advisory Board. That was welcome, Nikki. Okay. And then lastly, we have Dr. Um, Marsha Tremel Goldstein, who is from Denver and graduated from East High School. She holds degrees from Metropolitan State University of Denver, University of Colorado Denver, and a PhD in American History from the University of Colorado at Boulder. Her dissertation, Meet Me at the Ballot Box, Women's Innovations in Party and Electoral Politics in Post-Suffrage Colorado from 1893, to 1898, traces the bold footsteps of Colorado suffragist leaders into all, an all-male arena of politics after winning full voting rights in 1893. She's the author of Denver Women in Their Places, A Guide to Women's History Sites, Historic Denver, Inc., 2002. She taught American and Colorado history at Arapaho Community College and presented hundreds of lectures on the history of Colorado women's suffrage movement. Marsha's husband, Jeffrey Goldstein, was a pro bono 
lead attorney in the successful landmark litigation to restore historic land rights of the Chicano ranchers whose property rights stemmed from the Sangre de Cristo Mexican land grant in what is now referred to as Costilla County, Colorado. During the decades of litigation, Marcia served as part of the legal team, organizing exhibits, fundraisers, and trial support. Goldstein supports pro bono consultation, research, and writing services to a number of community organizations, including the Colorado Women's Hall of Fame, the Center for Colorado's Women's History at History of Colorado, the Denver Public Library Western History Department, East High School, and its past president from 2018 through 2019 of the historic Denver Women's Press Club. With that, let's welcome Shirley. Marsha. All right, well, I've been talking more than enough, so we'd love to hear from you all. Um, to start off our conversation, Shirley, I would love to hear, how would you describe your lifelong relationship with La Sierra? Long. <laughs> um, good evening, and thank you for being here, and thank you for the invitation, Ms. Celeste. I would describe my relationship with the Sierra as I was born and raised in that community. I started this struggle when I was a senior at Adams State University. Back in the day, it was Adams State College. Um, the summer before I became a senior at Adams State, I was a business major hoping to fly away with the airlines to be able to work with the airlines. My life took a, a, a turn, obviously. I was, I dropped out of college, which just horrified my mother because I was in my senior year and the only one of five siblings that was going to complete a, a college degree. So I was not even 21 when I started in this struggle. Uh, recently, I turned 68. So for me, it has been, it has consumed my entire adult life. And even though the legal case is, is over, so to speak, the legal issues that still continue to this very day. It was a very exciting and historic week in Costilla County in my community with some of the issues that our county commissioners have taken forward with some of the current issues that are happening and that is a fence that is being built around these almost uh, 80,000 acres. Uh, so my relationship has been life changing. Mm -hmm. Uh, never did I imagine that I would be in this situation. I am a product of the Chicano movement, most definitely. Um, Reyes Lopez Tijerina was not only a good family member, but a mentor who really taught me as, long, as well as the elders in the community about the history of the uh, Sangre Cristo land grant and my rights, as well as all the others in my community, what it meant to be an error and what... Um, and what rights came with that? Because it wasn't anything I learned in public education. I got wind of this um, when I took my first Chicano Studies class at Adams State back in 1976. Learning who I was and my place on this earth as a, as a woman, a woman of color, a Chicana, which I identify with as a Mexicana, just um, took me to places that I am today. So it, it changed my life. It, in so many different ways. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, Nikki, I'm curious, what drew you to write your PhD dissertation on San Luis land rights struggle and why do you believe this part of history is so important for people to know about? Good evening, everyone. Thank you for putting this together and it's really an honor to be up here with Shirley and Marsha, two of my heroes. Um, <laughs> um, what drew me to it. I was hired by, Marcia was like, Marcia and I went to grad school together at CU Boulder. We were in the same PhD program. And she was like, what are you doing this summer? And I was like, I don't know. And so um, she said, well, would you like to be a researcher on the land rights case? And I really didn't know much about it at all. Um, but I talked to Marcia about it further. And I talked to Jeff, um, who was the lead attorney and so I was like yeah that sounds that sounds really incredible so I spent most of a summer down I think it was 1997 um, in the community doing research and so I, I was an employee I was I was doing some research for the land for the attorneys um, there were like eight I think on the legal team at that point um, 
Yeah, there, there were quite a few attorneys. And so that just led to relationships in the, San Luis, in the town of San Luis. I made friends, the people I interviewed, oral histories, um, just really inspiring. And I felt like I knew quite a bit about the community at that point and, and the history. And I wanted to honor the people that I grew to really respect. And so that's why I did it. And the second part of your question, yeah. Um, why do you believe it's important for people to know oh, about this? Oh, yeah. I could go on for a history. long time. <laughs> um, it's our history as a state, and it's a piece of our history that has often gotten left out of the dominant narrative of Colorado. Um, it's who we are. We carry our histories with us, and that's individually and as a state, as, an, as a nation. It's an important part of... Um, Chicano history, I mean, oftentimes in the media, in some historical narratives, we're looked at as a monolith, you know? Um, immigration is, is often associated with our community when, when in fact, as Celeste said earlier, the border crossed many of us and our families. Um, and also it explains some of the legal and land and political history of our country, of our state, sorry. And, um, I mean, I could go on and on. There's also, I think you alluded, Celeste, there's, it's a repository of wisdom when it comes to environmental practices. I'm mean, surely has been really instrumental in trying to bring those practices back with the Asequia system and um, just different land practices. So, th so that's some of the reasons. Thank you for that. All right, Marsha. <laughs> um, knowing that Jeff served as the lead attorney um, on this case for, for many, many years, and you also supported it as part of the legal team. What do you carry with you from that period of time in your life? Well, as both of these friends and uh, uh, idols of mine <laughs> uh, have said, it's changed my life for sure. And I think it's changed a lot of people's lives, and, and most importantly, the people who live in San Luis um, in the villages in that area. Um, it's, as you mentioned, Celeste, that this is sort of a David versus Goliath, Goliath struggle. Um, and because the people persisted over not just a few years, but decades and even centuries, um, the, the struggle never ends. But there's a lot of twists and turns in the middle. And if you don't, if you don't, prepare for that, you're never gonna succeed. And the other part is just the grassroots part of it, that the people, the legal system is one thing and it's an important thing to, to use as a tool, but without the people organizing behind these lawsuits, it will go nowhere. Mm -hmm. So that's a lesson that I have learned over many years, but um, anyway, that's, it's changed my life. And actually, just to say one more thing about it, more importantly almost is it's been an honor and a privilege to meet the people of the San Luis community and especially Shirley and some of the other leaders of the Land Rights Council. I just, I can't even describe how important it is. For me, the little girl that grew up in Denver and of course never knew about this struggle until my husband and I begot, became involved as, as part of the legal team. Um, we, it's just an honor. That's all I can say. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Shirley, I'm, I'm, okay, so in part of your story and in part of at least what Nikki like refines in part of her research is um, just how important it was around identity for the San Luis community to understand their identity as Chicanos and how that was pivotal. Like, is common and still in Southern Colorado and Northern New Mexico, many people identified more as Spanish Americans or Mexicans or with nothing at all, you know, sometimes that's true in our communities too. But I'm, I'm curious around, um, why did you believe it was so important for folks to understand their identity in this shared way as Chicanos? And then how did um, sharing this identity of being Chicano inspire and challenge the San Luis community as you were building the Land Rights Council alongside Apollina Arial and Rey Otero. Um, being born and raised in San Luis, a small, rural, isolated community like that was once part of northern New Mexico, um, I never really understood. I mean, I knew I was Mexican. I used to hear my parents' generation say, we are Spanish Americans. 
that never really settled well with me. I can't explain that because I really did not under I did not know my history. Um, I did not know who I was or where I came from. That didn't happen until I graduated from high school in 1977 and went on to Adams State, and that was the tail end of the Chicano movement, but nonetheless, it was still present. Um, and having taken a Chicano Studies class and learning more about it, it, it just opened up this whole other world for me. It's like turning on a, a, a light switch, like they say. And then I became a mother. I have four daughters. I became an educator. Um, I realized I was a woman, a woman of color, that women were treated as second-class citizens. Um, the word Chicano really resonated with me because it identified who I was. Um, that definition for me is my culture, and having a culture is the way you think, feel, and act, and that was very important. As an educator of 32 years, I just in December retired from teaching ethnic studies and creating programs in the Western Slope and in San Luis to keep um, our students in school and out of that. Uh, prison pipeline, I realized the power of cultural identity is the most powerful thing that I myself have ever had for myself. I understood the power of cultural identity. It gave me the confidence and it gave me um, that self-awareness that I knew, even though I was not a tall woman, I was an outspoken woman, I knew the injustices, and it created, uh, I was angry when I learned my identity, I was very angry at the public school system, at my parents, at my community, that nobody had ever taught me who I was, that I was a Mexican living on stolen land, that I was indigenous, I am Hakari Apache, I've done the DNA, I can trace my history back to 1532, that's 22 generations, and I have the paperwork to prove it, and I can prove it. That gives you pride, that gives you cultural awareness, that makes you a whole other different person where I have no fear. Call me um, crazy, call me whatever, but I have no fear, I didn't fear Jack Taylor, I didn't fear Lou Pye, I didn't fear the hell, the Welches and the last owners, and I don't fear this current owner. So that was important to proceed forward. In my community, you still have, even for Santana this year, the banners went up of your family throne or whatever it's called, and it's all the connection to Spain. And I don't like that. Uh, yes, I understand that as a Mexican, I am half Spanish, uh, and I am half indigenous, and that is what creates the Mexican. If we were going to um, be successful in this case, which we knew was a long, a long shot, we knew that, we understood that, but we promised our elders, Apolina Rael and the others that actually taught us who we were and what it meant to be an heir, that we would s exhaust all the legal remedies in this country. And if we weren't successful like the way we were, we were going to take it to the world court in uh, San Jose, Costa Rica. And our attorneys knew that. Um, so it was important as we organized these 118 plaintiffs to stand in the shoes of their ancestors in 1960, that they understood and that they were going in there with their eyes open. That yes, we have Spanish blood, but we also have indigenous blood. We, all, we are Mexicanos, but we have been taught to be ashamed of that, the dirty Mexican concept, right? We all remember that. And um, it was time to pull those covers off, to snatch them and say, this is who we are. Whether we like it or not, geographically, this is who we are. There are still folks in San Luis who say, I'm Spanish American, I'm sorry, but I have no tolerance for ignorance at my age anymore. If you are not aware of who you are, that is your problem. And how sad to die not understanding and recognizing who you are. That has changed. Due to the Chicano movement and those generations that came before me, we now understand what a Chicano means, and we're not ashamed of call ourselves. Yo soy Chicana, and I am proud of that. And if we we're gonna continue identifying and claiming the land that was rightfully ours, recognizing that before the Mexican descendants came in, that my brothers and sisters, the Jacaria Apache, the, the Southern Ute, the Navajo, the Dene, they were there. They were there before we were there. And there was a, 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 an organized, community and society and a way of life with traditions and culture and pride that were going on. That's a part of who we are. Look at me, my students tell me, I miss Shirley. Um, 
Se parece una India. You look like an Indian. Of course, I am. I am proud of that. Still members in my community who say, oh, no, no, I'm, I'm not indigenous. I'm not Mexican. I wasn't born and raised in Mexican, in Mexico. That's ignorance. We all know that we've got that Spanish blood. So I choose to identify all of it and be proud of that. And I choose to do away with the things that harmed um, our our community, things that I do not pass down, that I did not pass down to my four daughters. This part we're not gonna deal with. The other part we're gonna deal with, knowing that the good and the bad is what makes us. But it was important for people in my community to understand their ethnic identity and our connection to Mexico if we were gonna move forward to make claims that we are heirs to a Mexican community land grant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much for that. So much of that also resonates with me, you know, and part of my identity as a Chicana, like, especially, um, well, my family are Tejanos. We're all from Texas, right, from the borderlands down there. And um, when I came to Colorado, it's like similar to what you're describing, like having access to higher education. I was finally learning history of things that were just in my own city in San Antonio. I remember learning about an activist and organizer, Emma Tenayuca, right, who was also a short, like, chaparita, if you will, like, very small, high voice, but she, like, organized some of our basic workers' rights, right, and I remember learning her story and just feeling so inspired, and then hearing more and more about the Chicano movement here in Colorado, because while part of my childhood was also in California, I'd only ever learned that one kind of monolith kind of narrative, right, that, um, this is just about farm workers' rights, or this is just about these Mecha chapters and universities, but it's not necessarily about our relationship of our culture. Sometimes that gets missed, I feel like, in, in that conversation. And I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit, um, but um, I'm really curious, I'm, I'm curious, Nikki, why do you think we do not learn as much about the land rights struggles of the Sangre de Cristo land grant, specifically in San Luis and Tierra Maria, when we learn about Chicano history? Um, good question. So I don't even think we learn enough about Chicano history. So I think there's a lot of different um, narratives that we don't know. And I think in particular, the land rights, I would say that it's complicated, right? I mean, Shirley just talked about how one of the communities didn't has been so reluctant to acknowledge the roots. And so I think it's it's very complicated and, and it's it, there's trauma there as well. Um, there's a, an exhibit down at Fort Garland right now about indigenous slavery and how some of the Spanish surnamed families had indigenous slaves, um, enslaved people. Um, and so I think it, it's a painful history. And I also think that, you know, there's there's legal issues that you know, certain people or certain groups don't want to call attention to, such as, you know, treaty rights. Um, this, this is a really good example of that. And, I mean, we haven't had enough people telling those stories on kind of the mainstream level. So, a combination of factors, as always. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and some of that, right, is like that ongoing impact of colonization and the ways that we experience that now. I mean, something that's, I think, to note is for folks that identify as Spanish American, that's really intentional. Because proving your Spanish heritage or connection to the peninsula allowed you to have rights in society. Um, and so all of that to say, um, anyways, I feel like we could talk all night, but let, let's get to some, some more questions. Um, Marsha, I'm curious, what inspired Jeff to accept this offer to be the lead attorney um, I know that it was kind of like a toss up for a little bit, but yeah, what, what inspired him to accept the offer and um, what kept him and you motivated throughout all the years on this legal case? Well, first of all, I wanted to show, this is here, you can just, <laughs> uh, this is a, a special, I still have this in my living room. This was a special um, poster that was made by the people of San Luis uh, after he passed away, and I still, like I said, I still have him in my living room. Um, this was his life's work. Um, he would never give up. Uh, Jeff went to law school in Los Angeles and had a couple of very progressive pro professors. 
Um, and the whole time he started practicing law was uh, involved in class actions, in poverty, um, you know, land, uh, tenant, landlord tenant law, all kinds of early legal aid kind of cases. And then when he came to Denver, he joined the National Lawyers Guild chapter here in Colorado, which um, I just want to quickly say the National Lawyers Guild goes all the way back to the 1930s uh, during the New Deal and the great uprising of labor unions during that time. Um, and it was established to be what they called the legal arm for the movement of social change. And so it, distingu it distinguished, the organization distinguish, is, it distinguished itself <laughs> mm -hmm. as being uh, what you might call movement lawyers. Mm -hmm. They weren't afraid to take on the difficult cases. They, in 99% of the cases, did them pro bono, which means free. No, I mean, not free in terms of legal costs, but no attorney's fees. And that I just wanted to emphasize, at some point or another, they said they hired Jeff. Um, <laughs> uh, basically, he, well, he, we got a little money from the Campaign for Human Development to hire um, researchers and law students and people like Nikki. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, all of the lawyers, and there were, I think, about 30 at this point, all together from 52. the very be 52, is it? Oh, you know better than me now. 52. <laughs> 52 lawyers have worked on this case since uh, the early 1980s when Jeff first started. He, he and his partners had a progressive law firm, and they had been sent um, because they were the closest lawyers to Wounded Knee in, 18, in 1973 during the Wounded Knee occupation, they drove back and forth over and over again to defend the American Indian Movement leaders in, in Wounded Knee. So that's just one example. There were other cases here. For, uh, they worked on cases for the Crusade for Justice, um, other Native American cases here in Denver. And the anti-war movement, I'll tell you that, too. That was a big thing. Um, so anyway, this was a culmination of Jeff's, all of Jeff's uh, principles, if you will, and his political uh, viewpoint and the opportunity to use his legal skills. And I think part of it was just being stubborn. <laughs> so um, anyway, I, I, the only other say, thing I would say about that is just as the people were organizing in the community, which was the most important thing, the work that Shirley was doing, uh, it took a huge amount of work to organize the lawyers because most of them do not have the, the experience, the life experience of not having privilege and not being in control, not having power. And so in order to recruit all of these lawyers, including some of the big corporate law firms here in Denver, eventually through the Lawyers Committee, these people learned a huge amount more. They learned more from the people in San Luis than they ever learned in law school, I think. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's part of the whole struggle is organizing all of the, con the contingencies, all of the teams, all of the people that you need to get your job done and finally win, right? Uh, we hope. <laughs> I wanna make sure Shirley gets to tell a little more about what he's doing now, even with all these victories in the courts. It's ridiculous, they won't give up, so. Mm -hmm. First, I wanna talk a little about Jeff. So I didn't expect to get emotional up here, but um, Jeff was salt of the earth. I mean, I'm gonna cry. He's a good man, and um, I think he is, I mean, he didn't give up because he loved the community and he, he was committed to doing what's right. And he's one of my heroes. Oh, he was more than that to us. You know, I always, we say we got Jeff, but we also got Marsha. And, and we really did. And like most women that are involved and we don't get our story told, Jeff couldn't have done the work without Marsha there. Um, and, and Nikki, because Nikki came in, and Nikki won't tell you, but Nikki suffered in my community by folks who, um, who didn't believe that we needed outsiders, we needed allies. Nikki was an ally. 
But I want to talk about Jeff briefly before I get the next question. You know, I've, I've worked with the 52 lawyers that have been pro bono. Jeff was our lead attorney till we got the victory, then he was appointed as a judge and, and somebody else took over. But I gotta tell you, um, we, we put Jeff through a test. We gave Jeff hell. I'm not gonna lie, and Jeff knew that. Um, we, we would tell him, we're gonna come in, we the organizers, we the plaintiffs, we the community, we're gonna come in and we're gonna make the, the mess, and you're gonna be the mouthpiece and you're gonna clean it up for us. And what we meant by that was, Jeff did not have any experience in litigating land grant cases. N no one did at this point. No one had that in the whole country. No one had that. Uh, but we knew our history, we knew our rights, we taught Jeff how to put it into a legal argument, into a legal perspective. And he taught the others. By the end of this, Jeff and I uh, were scheduling to travel to Spain to, because uh, Spain heard about this case, to travel to Spain to um, teach other lawyers about land grant law. We were never able to do that, but that's how far it got. Jeff came into this not knowing anything. And when he left, and by the time he died, he was probably the most knowledgeable lo uh, lawyer next to one in New Mexico um, in this whole country. So he learned by doing, by uh, paving the path. But I want to talk about who he was as a person. People in my community, if anybody knows anything about San Luis or you have connections, um, we guard who comes into this community and we safeguard what we have because of what has happened to us. The, the fact that they raided our community, they raided our community so we could drop this, drop this lawsuit so we could be scared. We didn't do that. Jeff took the punches that we gave him figuratively and um, he put up with a lot of crap that many of the macho men in my community uh, put him through, but he survived the test. And by the time it was all said and done, people in my community loved Jeff. They loved him. To this day, we still talk about him because Jeff made the time to make those personal relationships with different people, not only the plaintiffs, and really understand and spend time in my community, in our community, to understand why we were so stubborn and passionate and determined about what we were doing. He is like un unlike any other lawyer that I have worked with. And I tell you, I worked with all 52 lawyers myself. And I also want to say that nobody does this. I get to be the spokesperson. I get to be the face sometimes. But nobody does it alone. Beside me, in front of me, behind me, there have been hundreds and hundreds of people, allies, white allies, uh, indigenous allies, black allies, that were a part of that because our struggles were parallel. That's what this struggle meant. And, and, and we couldn't have done it without Jeff. He truly was the one lawyer that convinced all the other lawyers, because I'll end with this. For the first 12 years, it was Jeff. It was Jeff. And until we got our first victory, like in 1992, I believe, were we able to convince the other downtown firms here in Denver to jump on the bandwagon. Again, all of them, all 52, having um, been involved in this case for now 45 years, um, pro bono. That's unheard of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this brings me to um, that moment, right, when the state commission got involved in the Sierra Foundation. Uh, we're, we're promoting this other strategy, right, about purchasing the land. And then, of course, like some of Zachary Taylor's actions be like, well, maybe I'll give you some land, but if you do this and that, I'll take it back. I'm, I'm really curious, uh, Shirley, when it comes to that, what do you think are some important lessons for grassroots organizations, as well as these types of like foundation and state commissions to, to harvest from this period of time? Um, I'll be perfectly honest. Everything I say I own. I am not a fan of Ken Salazar, even though he's from my backyard in Los Sauces. I am not a fan of him, even though he is in Mexico representing doing whatever the heck he's doing. I say keep him in Mexico. Um, and the reason I'm not a fan of him, and a correction that I got to make Celeste, we never partnered with the Catholic Church in San Luis, ever. As a matter of fact, I was raised Catholic when I was a sophomore in school. I left the Catholic Church because the local priest was molesting one of my um, classmates. I personally left the Catholic Church. What we did get funding from was the Campaign for, Hum 
for human development. That's the social funding arm of the Catholic Church. And I'll tell you why the Catholic Church was never involved. They would have never gotten involved with us anyway. We were a bunch of radicals. That's what, I wasn't called Shirley, I was Ivianessa radical. There comes that radical. I own that and I wear it like a badge of honor because to me being radical means that you want things done and you want them done yesterday. So I was upset with Ken Salazar like many of us were in our community because he was partnering with the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church, even though Pat Valdez, the local priest, was a great supporter of us, even when he was at the local church here in North Denver. Father Pat stands as Father Pat individually, not as a gentleman, not as the priest and a man of the cloth. So Ken Salazar and this La Sierra Foundation were using the Catholic Church on Saturday evenings when church was going on from the pulpit to tell people, sell your land. Because what they wanted was they wanted to make it a state park. There was no way in hell we were gonna let that happen. And um, part of that was in order for it to become a state park, we had to drop the lawsuit. That was not going to happen. In no way, shape, or form was that going to happen. So once they were having their private meetings, we happened to walk in to one of the private meetings where we should have been at the table discussing this as plaintiffs while we weren't. That's when we went in there as radicals and told them, no way, we will never drop the lawsuit. That ended that. And many local people that were part of this, and I'll, I won't mention names because there might be some dolientes in the room of some of these people, so I, I won't go that far. Um, those people ended up coming to our side. So what they did next was raid our community. Well, if we can't do this, then we're going to raid our community and we're going to plant someone in there and ask that everybody from Cuesta, New Mexico to San Luis to bring us bear cloths, to bring us eagle cloths, to bring us all these things that our traditional farmers never went after our traditional hunters. We just wanted food for our subsistence. So then the state brought that in. So it was the lessons that we learned, that I personally learned, this is just me, is the tenacity that our community had. We were, in 1960, uh, the highest level of education was eighth grade and everybody spoke Spanish. My generation came in as products of the Chicano movement who knew our history and knew a little bit more. And that's why our elders, like Apolinar and Juan Lacombe and others said, now we want to take it back to court because your generation knows more about your history. We know more about the legal system in the United States. Um, so therefore, we want to go back to court because I'll be honest with you, we went in there wanting to take that property back armed. We were prepared to do that. And I'm not kidding about that. We were prepared to do that. Uh, today, we would have been uh, labeled domestic terrorists and I'd be in, um, in prison. What I did learn was the tenacity that our community had that when you're dealing with the truth, even though it was a long shot, we are better off today had we not done anything. And one of the things that I will be honest to and say to young people, that I always encourage you to become active in these uh, social justice issues, especially now in the era that we are living in since Trump came into office in 2016. What we're doing here would be considered critical race theory and we shouldn't be doing this. The 30 years that I spent teaching ethnic studies, that would also be considered that. We learned a lot of lessons, but the most important lesson we learned is that we are the poorest county in the state of Colorado. And even at that, we might be uh, money poor, but we're rich in, in land, we're rich in water, we have the first water rights in our acequias. We learned that we could do it when nobody believed. Nobody believed me, I'll tell you what, even some of my own members my own family members went to their grave ashamed of the work that I did. Well, too bad for you because here we are and we're victorious, right? So you, I learned that you have to take a risk to gain something. And if you sit back and bitch and complain, no one is gonna get up and do it for you. I also learned that when you're involved in an issue like this, I have a file about this thick with the FBI. Not that I've done anything illegal, but that I've spoken up and that I have been involved. I have always been watched, my phones have been tapped, my children and I have been under the crosshairs of, of, of FBI rifles when, we're, when we are doing these campouts and these conferences, and we still, even more today. So we do put our life at risk, but 
That's a choice. No one made me do this. It's a choice. And I made that choice as I got older because I became a mom. I wanted to leave something not only to my daughters, but to my grandsons, to the community, to the young people in the community, which is why I still work with young people. So we learned that if you don't stand up, you don't speak up, if, you, if there is no action, there is no progress. Many other things that we've learned. All right, I, okay, I, usually we would open up to the audience and I feel like it's really important to ask this question. Um, you, Shirley, you were a phenomenal coalition builder and that seemed to be extremely important for the greater understanding of what was happening in the San Luis community and in support of ultimately the victory. And I'm curious to hear from each of you as we're, we're kind of wrapping up our, our time here um, first, for you, like, what um, inspired you to pursue that particular strategy? I feel like you've touched on that a little bit, but if you could share a little bit more, um, that would be incredible. And I'm curious to hear also from Nikki and Marsha how you saw that strategy um, put into place as well as in support of ultimately what was the, the legal victory in 2002. A couple of things for me. I was an angry uh, college student. W when I learned, took Chicano studies, like I said earlier, and I learned my true history, my true history, my family's true history, my community's history, and everything that my antepasados, my ancestors had done so that I could be in this place tonight, um, I was angry. And as I became a mother, I became a mother at the age of 23, I knew that that anger, that I had to channel that into something different because it was going to destroy me. Um, and I decided that um, coupled with that, I always have had good mentors. I knew Cesar Chavez, I knew Reyes Lopez Tijerina, I knew Corky Gonzalez, I knew Jose Angel Gutierrez. But what was missing in that mix in the Chicano movement was the women. The women that I knew were in the back cutting the pozole and the menudo and would take off their aprons and go and would take care of not only the children, like at the crusade and across the Southwest, but they could also handle things like this. They could grab a, mic a, a microphone and, do, and, and deal with the media and, and deal with the cops and deal with the issues. Um, I, I, I knew then, at a very young age, I've always said, I think I'm an old soul, but I also believe that I was born at the right time because I saw the changes that were taking place within the, back, the black community. I saw, um, I married one of the best community organizers in the state, and that was Ray Otero. We are no longer together, but we're, we still support each other, and he was really the backbone. Had it not been for Ray Otero, this issue would have never made it to the forefront. None of us would be here. He was asked by the elders to come. He was a Vietnam veteran who did two tours in Vietnam, excuse me, one tour in Vietnam, but he was a, um, a jumper. He was a, a, a paratrooper. Um, and uh, I learned from the best. I was lucky to have the best mentors in the movement, both men and women. And I knew that if those changes could take place within the American Indian movement, within the Black Panther Party, we've always, we never, worked with the Palestinians, but we, uh, we have also been in solidarity because our struggles are definitely one of the same. They parallel. I saw, I knew that the issue, what we had to do in terms of coalition building was two things. Had to educate people to their rights and their history. If you don't know your history, then you think you're part of the macro culture. And let me tell you, we're not part of the, of the macro culture. We never will be. So it was important to understand that. I knew that that anger needed to be turned into passion, and I did that. And what helped me turn it into passion is I wanted to be a good role model for my daughters. I wanted to do something better, and I wanted to be whatever I got involved in to be sustainable. So I knew that it required learning, listening more than talking, and learning from the best, asking for questions, and building those allies outside of the Chicano community, with the white community, with the black community, with the indigenous community, with anybody that had empathy for us and could relate to our struggles in whatever form. 
That was important because nobody does it alone. And I also learned that the only one thing that the government fears is when we're on the street in full force and building those allies and those coalitions it is what scares this government more than anything else and is needed. If you hear nothing about what I say tonight to the young people here, you're all college students, learn from those movements because we need you because we backslided in this country. And I fear, but my hope and my healing comes with what young people in this room and across this country are gonna do. So it's about coalition building and building allies and dealing with the truth. If you know who you are and where you come from, you don't have to remember what lie you said yesterday to move forward. It's about knowing who you are and what your rights are, standing up and speaking up and knowing that your voice means something. Yeah, thank you all so much. Let's give our panelists a round of applause once again. I feel like, you know, there's, there's so many things that we could learn and um, continue to learn, specifically from the struggle as well as um, just, yeah, from all of the, not just resilience, but the persistence still to this day of the San Luis community and honoring their rights. And thank you again to each of you for being here, for sharing with us. Thank you, Shirley, for traveling all the way up here tonight. Um, truly, this is such an important uh, story to not just archive, but to learn from and how we build power. Mm -hmm. Come to our community. You're all invited to come to our community. Tomorrow at 10 o'clock, we have all of the administration from CSU Pueblo coming into San Luis because they've got so many students that are attending their university. It's a Hispanic serving institute. It's also the month of September, Hispanic month. So come any other time, not only in September. I invite each and every one to come. I personally will give you a tour so that you can understand why San Luis and the history of this land grant case and the resiliency of the people is so important and should be taught from kindergarten, preschool, all the way through 12th grade and beyond because it's such an important part of who we are. So I welcome each and every one of you to come to San Luis. Thank you, Shirley. Thank you for that invitation. Um, and thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here this evening and taking time to learn about this social movement. Thank you to Community Language Co-op for interpretation, to Denver Open Media for providing our AV tonight, um, to Regis, Office of Diversity and Inclusion Excellency, especially um, Nikki and Adriana and the work-study students who are here supporting us. Um, and thank you to the Colorado Trust for financially supporting this particular series. Um, there will be two more sessions coming up as part of this series. Um, on October 12th, we will have a series, uh, or we'll have that session on the Chicano movement. We'll go deeper into the crusade for justice and that unique history here in Colorado, as well as November 9th on the American Indian movement and meeting with indigenous leaders who are also continuing to defend and fight for their land rights um, today. So um, please stay tuned and please join us for that. Um, and thank you again for being here. <laughs>